Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Fresh Natural Live. We are here from Houston, and as usual, we have a great show for you tonight. Uh, it is Monday, June 6, 2022, and tonight we're going to talk about how to improve your circulation. There's some, of course, we all know that eating a healthy diet and exercise, those things work, but um, there's some technology that can also help, and we actually are implementing that technology some exciting information for you, so get your pen and pencil ready. Uh, it's going to be a great show as usual. Uh, so I'll see you shortly as we get started right now. Okay, welcome back. As I said, we're going to talk about the, how to improve your circulation. Circulation, as you know, is very important for all functions of the, of the body. The brain, of course, the heart uh, kicks it off, but the heart itself needs its own circulation. It's called the coronary arteries that feeds blood to itself, uh, which is important for optimal heart function. Uh, but the kidneys, your bones, your joints, uh, nerve condition, people with neuropathy, have neuropathy due to poor circulation to the nerves. That's very common in diabetics. Uh, poor circulation to the joints associated with arthritis and, and poor joint healing uh, and uh, joint degeneration. So circulation is very, very important. We often think about circulation from the standpoint of large blood vessels. Uh, if you see a cardiologist like myself or a vascular uh, specialist, like a vascular surgeon, uh, we'll do uh, procedures like angiograms where we uh, take pictures of arteries under fluoroscopy, under radiation or x-ray, uh, and we get a picture of whether these uh, arteries uh, are blocked, quote-unquote, or narrow, the stenosed, as we like to say. Uh, however, this is only part of the picture, and today we're going to talk about other aspects of circulation that's very, very important. But before we get to that, I want all of you to hit the thumbs up, uh, give us a thumbs up right away. Uh, give us a like. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. And of course, share this very important information with uh, friends and loved ones or anyone you think may benefit from it. Uh, but before we go on, I'm going to invite my friend and, and colleague, uh, Asosa Edosalem, our resident nutritionist. Asosa, how are you today? Welcome. Good. Welcome. How are you? It's making a grand appearance. And, and, um, we're going to be talking about uh, how to improve your circulation. And uh, I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on some technology called electromagnetic technology, some electromagnetic frequency technology. Uh, and there are a number of different devices out there. There's one particular device that uh, uh, goes under the trade name Beamer, which we use, uh, hmm. we'll start using. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off uh, sharing some information uh, on a study that uh, I pulled from the medical literature. A lot of the science uh, is done in Germany. Uh, so there's not a lot of data here in the United States. There's not a lot of uh, clinicians using this. We certainly don't use it uh, in the allopathic medical uh, treatment arena. Uh, there are lots of patients that I see whom I see can benefit from it. In fact, many patients may uh, actually have limb salvage uh, because oftentimes what you have is you have diabetics or individuals with extreme severe uh, vascular problems. And of course, we know that the large vessels are compromised, but also the microcirculation is compromised as well. Uh, and they can benefit from treatments uh, such as um, um, uh, infrared sauna therapy, which improves vascular circulation, improves nitric oxide production, which has an effect on the large vessels. But there's a certain uh, technology which uses electromagnetic frequency, which enhances uh, function at the uh, microvascular levels. This is the arterioles and venules. So these are the very tiny blood vessels 
where uh, you have the same inner lining that's called the endothelium, which goes uh, in these blood vessels, but these blood vessels are just upstream from the capillaries, or in the case of venules, downstream from the capillaries. And the capillaries are very tiny, fenestrated blood vessels, and that's where all the business occurs. So capillaries have fenestrations where oxygen uh, and water is transmitted across, and oxygen is transmitted across, and that's where nutrients are transmitted. So this is where uh, your body is nourished, and also this is where waste is removed from the body and then delivered back and circulate out for elimination. And so uh, it's at this level uh, of circulation compromise is where you have a lot of disease states, uh, and this technology has been shown to benefit right at this level. So we're going to actually show you uh, some first we'll do uh, go through some scientific evidence, and I have some uh, videos that's going to actually show you the actual effects uh, of this um, um, technology and when we show you the actual uh, blood flow. And I'll have another video that gives kind of an overview of how this works. will help summarize this. So let's just go to my uh, presentation, uh, how to improve your circulation using electromagnetic technology. Um, there's a study done, and this is a, uh, out of Germany where they uh, took a group of men, the average age was around 50, and there were 24 men total. Uh, and there were uh, 12 that were, and these men, the, the setting was where they were in a rehab facility. Now, they didn't give a lot of details in terms of comorbidities of the like. They gave the age uh, and, um, and, and the like, but, uh, but basically they were in physical rehab uh, setting. Uh, and so they were exposed to the general treatment of physical conditioning of uh, individuals exposed to chronic stress and infection. So they were probably individuals who were in a rehab facility, may have been individuals who had been hospitalized, they may have had a chronic illness that they were recovering from. Uh, here in the United States, we have similar facilities called long-term acute care hospitals where let's say you're admitted to a hospital, you have a pneumonia, a heart attack, or whatever, and you've been bedridden, and then you go to a rehab hospital or, or, or long-term acute care hospital where you get long-term rehab. And, and the typical rehab in you know, most of these places where you get physical therapy, so it's basic physical conditioning, and, and here they call it counseling for health conscious lifestyle. So I'm not sure exactly what that means. But I doubt they had them on raw vegan detoxes. <laughs> but, but, but be that as it may, uh, this was the baseline setting for the, the patients in this setting. So they were divided in uh, two equal groups. There was a control group. And they the control group received the physical conditioning without the uh, intervention. So the intervention they described here is a physical stimulation. So they did not get the electromagnetic uh, frequency therapy. Uh, the Verum group, which was the treatment group, they received the baseline physical therapy, and but they did get the uh, electromagnetic frequency therapy. So two groups, one getting the regular therapy, but no extra uh, electromagnetic stimulation, and the other group uh, received the regular physical therapy and did get the electromagnetic stimulation. I'll describe that in a minute. And actually, the video that I'm going to play later is going to give you a nice general description of how the therapy works. And they use the Beamer Plus device, which is the commercial device that we'll be talking about. Uh, there are other electromagnetic, pulse electromagnetic uh, frequency therapy devices um, that have different uh, mechanisms and some are rated better than others. Uh, the Beamer therapy has uh, the most data. And so we decided to talk about it. So um, application of complementary therapy, essentially what they did is they uh, did me measurements. Uh, so they took uh, the, the uh, complementary therapy or the Beamer therapy was applied uh, twice a day uh, for 12 minutes each. And they were about two to three hours apart. So the patient would go in and get a Beamer therapy at one point and two or three hours later, get another 12 minute Beamer therapy. And we'll talk about what that therapy is. Essentially they lay on a mat and the electromagnetic frequency is delivered through their uh, bodies uh, through this mat that's connected to a, a device, the uh, Beamer device. Uh, the time period, so what they did is they measured uh, the parameters that we're going to talk about, blood flow, immune function, uh, um, vasomotor activity. They measured these things 
at day zero, uh, day five, day 15, day 10, day 15, day 20, and day 25. Uh, and so they looked at also day 30. And so they compared uh, the change in function uh, of measurements over this time period. I'm going to take a quick break here. And I want you, while I take a break, I want you to give, uh, I want you to give a thumbs up uh, and also give us a nice like and share this with anyone while we invite Dr. Ford Atkins here. Dr. Atkins, how are you doing today? I think you're on mute still. I think Dr. Atkins, you're on mute. Dr. Atkins, you're on mute. I don't know if you can hear me. You're on mute. Whoops. I know I'm having uh, technical issues here. So. Oh, Utah. okay. Oh, Utah. Utah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, <laughs> just fighting the uh, internet demons this evening, but I'm here. Okay, good deal, good deal. I, was, I thought your computer had monkeypox or something. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the vascular measurement takes, so what did they measure over time? So this is a little bit of a complex slide, but uh, so the characteristics were taken. Number one, they looked at um, determination of time, distance, function, arterial vessel wall oscillation. So basically, they looked at vasomotor. So how much did these vessels oscillate? And that's important because we think of our blood vessels as pipes uh, that um, uh, allow flow to go through. And, and that's a reasonable analogy with the exception of the fact that pipes, as we know them uh, inside building structures, do not uh, dilate and constrict. And, and, and vasomotor activity is an important activity for blood vessels uh, throughout the vascular tree because uh, if you have, for instance, uh, let's say you're in a, a car accident and you have an injury to a leg, uh, maybe you have a big cut or laceration, you're bleeding, uh, the body will know to constrict blood flow to that section of the body. Uh, it'll constrict blood flow to the leg and, and shunt it elsewhere. And so vasomotor activity is important uh, because the body will know to shunt blood from areas of where there's blood loss to areas where there's no blood loss. Also, if your body is in shock, your volume depleted, it will systemically shunt blood flow to areas that are less important and shunt it to areas that are most important. So that's certainly one aspect of vasomotor, you know, the, the ability of blood vessels to dilate, constrict uh, in terms of, of, of shifting uh, circulation preferentially to areas that are most important. However, this vasomotor or, or vascular uh, function uh, uh, approach is also important uh, from the standpoint of um, helping circulation flow. And then the video is going to explain this um, uh, very well. Uh, and um, But the circulation is uh, uh, greatly generated by the heart pumping. We all know that the heart pumps. You have systole and diastole and the heart contracts. And that pulsatile uh, pressure that's stimulated is transmitted throughout the vascular tree. However, you know, the blood vessel uh, uh, length is about you know, 75,000 miles long. So it's a very long uh, trip that you circulate, your blood goes through. And so when it gets to the tiny blood vessels, you've gone through lots of resistance. And so vasomotor activity at the vascular level, at the arterioles and even the venules is very important in terms of pushing blood through. So vasomotor activity is what's measured here. Again, this is how the blood vessels are pumping and the arterioles are pumping themselves and helping the transmission of flow. They also measure uh, particle flow uh, in venules or the veins, the, the tiny veins. So flow, blood flow in the veins was measured. They looked at the number of capillaries. They call them uh, nodes, but these nodes are capillaries. So you looked at the number of capillary beds that were perfused. Uh, so, and they measured in terms of volume of capillary beds. So those are three vascular measurements that were taken. They also looked at uh, metabolic measurements such as uh, venular oxygen saturation. So they looked at the amount of saturation uh, of blood, uh, of, of the, the uh, hemoglobin inside the arteries, the afferent arterioles and the efferent venules. So they looked at the saturation of blood or the hemoglobin going into the, the capillary bed and coming out of the capillary bed. And then they looked at a couple of things that was quite interesting that I thought was interesting. They looked at the transmigrated white blood cells, and we'll show you some images of this. They showed uh, where 
uh, how many white blood cells were adherent to veins before and after this uh, treatment. So this is important because uh, white blood cell adherence to vein, meaning that how many white blood cells stick to the veins uh, uh, correlate with the number of white blood cells that goes through the veins and into the tissue to, to treat infection. And so you want to see a, a big flow of, of, of uh, migration and then subsequent turn on off of migration once whatever infection or inflammatory process is uh, treated or addressed. Address. And then ICAM, which is an, an adhesion molecule, it's thought of as one of these um, uh, inflammatory mediators. Uh, it was also ICAM or adhesion molecule concentration was also measured. Again, it showed a big spike in the fall, as we're going to look at in just a minute. So these were the six basic parameters that were looked at uh, as a result of these, you know, 52 groups of, of, of 12 men uh, who went through this uh, treatment. So what, what did they find? Well, one thing I'm going to show you, now this is a busy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but, but it's worth talking about, even though this is technology beyond what I normally deal with on a regular basis. But what you're dealing with here is a schematic that shows uh, the use of laser Doppler. So basically, uh, you know, Doppler looks at echoes of, of flow. So basically, you know, if you, you know, if you ever been to the Grand Canyon or wherever, you shout out and you hear your voice, you know, stutters, you know, that's the echo of your voice. And so this echo technology or Doppler rather uh, technologies used in, in, in various aspects of medicine. We use it in ultrasound a lot. Uh, we, use, for instance, echocardiograms use Doppler technology, but you can also use laser Doppler technology where laser uh, uh, light penetrates the skin and you can look at differentials of, of Doppler uh, with laser technology. So that's this allows them to look at subcutaneous uh, tissues such as what blood vessels. And so laser Doppler therapy was, was looked at here. You have an external illuminator. Uh, you have various measuring devices that sends uh, image uh, uh, data into a PC. Uh, and it gives out data related to flometry, uh, body core temperature, RR, systolic and diastolic uh, mean pressure. Uh, this helps with vasomotor activity, uh, ECG respiratory frequencies. All this kind of data is captured and correlated so that you can look at the, the the timing of the physiological activity that's happening. Uh, and so, um, uh, and then you have laser Doppler, as I said before, that looks at microflow, RBC velocity. There's white light spectroscopy, which looks at oxygen saturation, as well as relative hematocrit data. So basically, laser technology, white light spectroscopy is used to penetrate the skin. And, and it sends back data into a computer uh, analysis uh, system that then gives you all this information. So I wanted to go through that uh, uh, complexity to show you how they're actually capturing this data in the study. So what do we see here? Uh, we're looking at the microcirculation. You see the dark part looks at blood vessels here. And this is a before. So this is day zero. And notice how you see the blood vessels in the tiny branches. There's a tiny branch here, tiny branch there. And by the way, um, I, I didn't put this detail here, but what they did also is they chose a specific part of the body. So they looked at the part of the abdomen and in the epigastric region, just a little bit, as they call caudal, down to the bottom. So it's sort of a, between the right upper, right lower quadrant uh, area. Uh, I would even say right upper quadrant, the lower aspect, the right upper quadrant of the abdomen is where they measured this. So that's this part of the skin they penetrated and look and make these vascular tissue measurements. And so they looked at that same spot in every patient every time. So it's the same location. So you're looking at the same vascular bed at 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 days. So what, what we see here at day zero, you see all these tiny blood vessels and you notice how, look at this tiny blood vessel here. It has a little bump, and it's the same little blood vessel here, okay? And so here. So you know you're in the same spot. But if you start to look closely, look at this spot right here, and notice how 
clear that looks and then look over here and notice that some other tiny vessels are filling in. So for instance, right under here between this one and this one, there's nothing. Between this one and this one, look here, you got blood vessels here, little branches there going here. Notice how you get this little branch here going here, okay? Uh, and, and it's all throughout here. Look between these two vessels. You see a little branch here and a little branch here. You don't see that there. So what you see here is an increase in vascular bed. So uh, so the microvascular region on day, this is day 25 in section B, showed a much richer uh, flow of vas vasculature. Uh, more blood vessels were seen. Uh, you can look in this little area here and compare it to this area here, much more. But look at there, this branch here. You see there, there's no branch there. Now it's there. So it's also, it's, uh, so essentially it's, it's a process of angiogenesis, if you will, or the growth or development of new blood vessels that's seen uh, after this treatment. Uh, so we go on here. Now this is um, at zero, and then this is on day 20. Now this is the vein. So from this area to this area is the lumen of a vein. And down here, this area, this area, lumen of, uh, this, area this area is the lumen of an artery. So you have the vein here and the artery there vein here, artery there. Now on day zero, notice there's nothing in here. You see these little striations there. Look on day 20. See here? These are white blood cells, these little circular globular looking uh, things, and they're adhering to the wall of this vein. Right there, right there, right there. Here, look at this one's going across. See that one? This, this one hasn't adhered yet. Uh, you may see this may be one going across. That's the same as there. But the point is that you see an increased adherence and migration of these white blood cells inside the veins. What does that mean? That means that you have an increased flow of white cells. Now, notice this is around day treatment day 20. And what they notice, and we're going to look at some graphs that depicts this, that you had an initial increase in adherence of white blood cells, and then it dropped off. And so... Um, and, and I'll explain that uh, in a minute. So here again, the treatment is associated with increased adherence of white blood cells. Uh, and so we look at uh, the measurements. So this is the data. So the clear boxes are the control and, and the shaded or hash box are the virum or the treated group, the group treated with the electromagnetic frequency. <coughs> Excuse me. So from day zero to five, so zero starts off at zero. So here's the increase in terms of, now this uh, box here represents the spontaneous arterial vasomotor. So this is the contraction. So this is how much vasomotor activity you had. And you had a significant increase uh, from zero to five, day five of the treatment group. Now notice that the uh, control group had improvement too. Now these guys were getting the regular physical therapy and also, you know, uh, a lifestyle, you know, uh, education. So from day zero to day five, there's a significant increase from five to 10, an increase in 10 to 15, an increase that seemed to be a plateau beyond day 15, maybe an increase from 15 to 20, probably not statistically significant, but uh, uh, you probably had the biggest statistical significant difference from five to 20. If you look at these error bars, you see there's a lot of overlap there but the air bar here definitely doesn't overlap with this. So from day five to 20, there's an increase and then you plateau beyond that. Uh, that's with the control. However, with the uh, EMF stimulation, you had a significant increase from zero to five, of course, but then also that significant increase from five to 10 days. And from 10 to uh, 15 days was probably a trend. And so you began to plateau, but the, but the increase was much greater uh, in the uh, electromagnetic treatment group. So more vasomotor activity is what we're seeing here. How about uh, the flow at, in the veins? So this is, if you look on the veins, it's outside the capillaries. So you got the arteries on one side and the veins on this side. So the arteries push it through, then it goes through the capillaries, and then you get the veins over here. And so ve venous flow was much increased greatly. Again, you had some improved flow here, but again, it wasn't nearly uh, nearly um, as much as you got uh, in the treated group. So again, flow through the veins, flow through the cap from the arteries to the capillaries of veins. So increased vasomotor arterial vasomotor activity. So the arteries are pumping more 
That's what's shown here. And then the flow in the veins is greater. That's what's shown here. Uh, very, very impressive changes in that period of time. Now, here's you're showing the number of blood uh, perfused nodes. They call them nodes. These are capillary beds. Uh, so again, you have an increase in uh, the perfusion of flow through the capillary beds. And remember, the capillary beds is where the activity happens. This is where oxygen and nutrients are taken to the tissue. So you really need to have good flow through the capillaries. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, have to have good flow out of the capillaries. So we show good vasomotor activity of arteries pushing blood into the capillaries. We are showing here good flow through the capillaries, increased flow in the capillary beds. And then the previous graph, I'm going to go back up. This one shows good flow outside of the capillaries or coming from the capillaries. Vasomotor activity into the capillaries, good flow through the capillaries, venous flow out of the capillaries. So we're, we're flushing and flowing the uh, the capillary beds very well. And this is important, of course, is where tissue gets nourished. So if you have poor flow through the capillary beds, poor flow through these microvascular uh, uh, systems, then nerves are not getting nourished, muscle not getting nourished. Uh, cartilage tissue is not getting nourished. So people with arthritis, this inflammation, this treatment is not helping. So if you get a chronic infection, uh, it's not going to be adequately treated because flow to this area is going to be compromised. Uh, this area can work against that. This treatment can work against that. Now, how about the uh, number of trans-migrating uh, white blood cells? Remember the, the, the uh, image I showed you here? I showed you increased white blood cells shown here in the vein compared to here at baseline. So they actually measured and quantified that. And, and, and the baseline treatment, and these are the clear box, the one you can barely see here, 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 and here. Notice that it was a modest increase, but the increase continued, okay? That's an important uh, thing to keep a, 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 a note of. Notice on the treatment section, you had a big increase of this migration white cells, and then even a bigger on day 10. And then on day 15, it dropped off 20, and then it became negative on day 30. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. Why didn't it keep going up? Well, the purpose of the immune system is to have a big initial surge. So let's say you have an infection or you have um, or, yeah, an infection or some other you know, uh, um, migration or, or in, uh, invasion, if you will, of something foreign, virus, bacteria, et cetera. The immune system is alerted. The cells go out and they attack. There should be a, a burst of activity early on. It should take care of the 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 uh, uh, migration. It'll take care of the uh, the uh, invasion, and then turn itself off. Uh, and so you see here a burst of inflammatory activity, and then it turns itself off. The turning off is important because you have a burst of activity that continues to go up. Then the body goes into sepsis. It goes into uh, a, a cytokine storm, and that's how people die. You know, you die not because of just the infection, because the body's going to fight against the infection. But if the body fights in the, against the infection in an uncontrolled, erratic manner, then what's going to happen is that the body is not only going to be fighting against foreign agents, but it's also going to be fighting against itself. So it's going to be destroying uh, a, a native tissue. So that's when you get sick. ARDS in the case of lung infections, kidney failure, blood clot formation, et cetera. So you want this process to be able to turn off. And you see that happening here. Um, here you have uh, oxygen saturation measurement. So venular oxygen saturation measurement. Uh, if you see in the control group, yes, it goes up, but very slowly and very modestly uh, compared to in the treatment group. Very br brisk increase in oxygen saturation and improves over 30 days. Uh, this oxygen saturation, the venular level, uh, which means that the tissue is well oxygenated going into the capillary bed. Uh, ICAM, which is an a, a inflammatory mediator molecule, shows a burst of increased activity here, and it drops off in a similar fashion as the white blood cells uh, do. So again, this is the immune system acting here, and this is oxygenation of tissue that's acting there, which is very important. So um, I'm going to stop there uh, with this presentation. I have a couple of videos uh, to show you. But what I'm going to do before I go to those videos, I'm going to ask you again, give us a thumbs up, uh, uh, you know, give us a like and share this information. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to show you some videos that's going to summarize this for you 
quite well. So stay tuned uh, for just a minute. Give us a thumbs up while we go to a break. Okay, we are back. Uh, we're back. I'm going to show, before I show a couple of videos, uh, I want to ask my colleague, do you have any comments you want to make uh, related mm -hmm. to that study or anything else uh, or questions you want to make? We're going to get to questions in the audience also. So help me look out for questions, comments in the audience. I didn't look at the chat so well. But anyway, any comments before I get to some of the uh, videos? Some of these videos are going to show up. It would be pretty impressive. Um, and I know, Dr. Eck, you've seen this before. Let's take a look at the first one. Uh, this Are shows, you currently using this, Dr. Montgomery? We, we're just, uh, we're going to start using this uh, within the next week. Dr. Atkins has been using this okay. for years, and he's going to share his experience okay. with this. Uh, but we plan to start using this uh, within the week, and we're going to start integrate this. Uh, I'm going to share some of the protocols we're going to add to uh, our treatment session. But we, we plan to start very soon. Let's take a look at this uh, uh, image here. Breathing. Breathing is the first thing we do when we're born and the last thing we do before we die. We can stay alive for long periods without eating, drinking, or sleeping. But if we cannot breathe, we die within a few minutes. Oxygen cannot be stored. It must be replenished continuously and steadily. Once inhaled, the oxygen makes its way to the lungs and hitches a ride with the red blood cells. Oxygen gains access to the body's cells through an internal network of vessels. Your heart is a champion. It works non-stop 24-7. Your heart electrifies itself, maintains blood pressure, and acts as the major pump to get your blood moving. The heart, together with the entire network of vessels, are known collectively as the circulatory system. Although it's easy to think of these vessels as a glorified plumbing system found behind the walls in your home, blood vessels are actually active, dynamic organs capable of contracting and expanding as they deliver nutrients and oxygen, carry away waste products and help maintain blood pressure, Along the way and further from the heart, the blood vessels become smaller and smaller, like branches of a tree. By the time blood reaches these small areas, the big pump and push that the heart supplied could use a little help before reaching their target tissues. And though it may appear as if the blood doesn't have to travel far at all, the blood vessels, if strung together, would equal a length of 100,000 kilometers, or 75,000 miles. That's enough to go around the globe nearly two and a half times. So the pump and vessels together make a closed system that begins and starts at the heart. The same five liters of blood cycles through your body all day, every day. To make this long journey, our blood vessels rhythmically contract and relax. This greatly assists the delivery of oxygen and nutrient-rich blood to all organs and tissues. This vasodilation process is vital to normal functioning of our entire body. Every part of our body needs blood to deliver oxygen and nutrients. And just like the trash man, we need blood to take away all the built-up wastes, such as carbon dioxide and lactic acid. The rhythmic vasodilation and vasoconstriction doesn't always work as well as it should. Lifestyle factors and age can play a role slowing down the heart's important helper. Diet, exercise, sleep, and how many candles on your birthday cake are all contributing factors. What happens is, because the contractions of the smaller blood vessels 
aren't occurring as frequently, there is less oxygen and nutrients being delivered to organs and tissues. This also means there is less waste being removed. Over time, this can lead to dysfunction. If the dysfunction accumulates for a long enough period, many cells and tissues become chronically stricken with waste buildup. In addition, these tissues are also forced to contend with prolonged lack of nutrition. You may start to notice this in a variety of ways, such as a lack of energy, poor fitness, and challenged sleep routines. Beamer therapy devices promote the foundation for health and for more than two decades have been developing patented technology aimed at providing a non-invasive, non-chemical mechanism for the improvement of blood flow. So that gives a nice overview of the circulatory system. And this next video is going to be a little bit shorter, but it's going to show um, actual uh, laser Doppler images of uh, microvasculature uh, and show some before and after flow. I think this is going to be pretty impressive. Uh, hold on. Oops. Beamer before and after comparison during an eight minute treatment. Changed function condition of microcirculation after stimulation of locally and superior regulated vasomotion. Initial conditions. No vasomotion, slow blood flow, hardly any supply of white blood cells, and the capillaries are not perfused. Just after the beginning of the Beamer treatment, you will see minor vasomotion, a minor increase in blood flow. Capillary is gradually being perfused, and aggregation of red blood cells dissipates slowly. During the Beamer treatment, it indicates strong vasomotion, quick blood flow, and an increased supply of white blood cells. Immediately after the Beamer treatment, notice significantly increased vasomotion, quick blood flow, and nearly adequate supply of white blood cells. For comparison, let's take a look at before and after the Beamer treatment. Once again, before the Beamer treatment. And now after the Beamer treatment. So there you have it. You get um, a nice overview of you know, the circulatory system, how things work. And, and those are, are real images that are taken uh, before and after treatment and using some of the laser Doppler and light spectroscopy uh, technology that I talked about earlier. So um, anybody, uh, Dr. Atkins, you have quite a bit of experience with this and um, you know, share with us your experience and, and um, you know, your take on this and if you want to add to any comments i've made uh, feel free to do so well um can you hear me uh yes yeah okay yeah the um we have been using the, the beamer i guess over five years in, in our facility uh and mainly because we wanted to use it as a therapy to uh improve blood flow you know uh, we always talk about exercise and circulation and it's important but you know, the take home point I want the audience to understand from this is that circulation is everything. If you have circulation, not only do you get the nutrients to the tissues that you need and oxygen, 
but you also remove waste. So the Beamer has a, a, a side effect to be able to detoxify as it well supplies the nutrient value to your body. And, you know, as a podiatrist for many years, one of the biggest issues we saw with patients was the peripheral vascular disease, which means your feet and legs, which are the most distant point away from your heart, are the last place to get blood flow. And so you start developing problems. And, you know, I guess we mentioned earlier what we talk about the, you know, blood supplies, um, not only the tissues and the blood vessels, in, in, especially in diabetes, you see a lack of supply to the skin. And that's when you start to have the skin breakdown, you have diabetic ulcers, you have uh, hyperpigmentation, you have all these conditions related to a lack of oxygen to the tissues and a lack of nutrients to the tissues. But also when you have a lack of nutrition or oxygen to the tiny uh, nerves in your feet and your fingertips and hands, those nerves tend to go to sleep and we call that peripheral neuropathy or it's a numbness in your hands and feet where you don't feel anything, you have a, a good sensation. Um, you also can have a, in the circulation to the, you have actually vessels that supply other blood vessels, we call them vaso, 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 yeah, they apply to other blood vessels. So if you cut off the supply to a blood vessel or even supply to the heart, then you get you know uh, dysfunction there. So uh, all those things lead to the breakdown of tissue in the hands and the feet, and we see it. Um, same thing with the eyes. Retinopathy is another thing with diabetes. Small blood vessels that supply the retina and, the, and your eyes tend to get clogged up, tend to get blocked up, and therefore you start having vision issues. So we see people when they have high blood sugar levels, and I'm using diabetes as this one example. This applies to any condition. Uh, I don't want people should understand that micro that this technology is not just for a condition or disease, but it's for overall wellness. And if you can increase circulation and keep it at a high level, then your body will take care of itself. It'll get the the um, immune cells that we need to circulate to the places they need to get to to fight the infection. It also get the oxygen to the areas that it needs to be able to produce energy because energy is a big thing, but you have to have oxygen to the tissues to produce energy. And the, every mitochondria in our body is waiting for that oxygen. And if it doesn't get it through the blood flow, you know, you, you fatigue, chronic fatigue, um, um, all of the conditions is related to uh, fatigue issues. One of the in our facility, we we would do the um, uh, approximately eight minute treatment, and eight minutes sounds like a short period of time, but let me tell you, you could do eight minutes, and I've done it myself for a number of years. That was my regimen, eight minutes twice a day. Uh, but not only do you feel rested after you do that, but it it really energizes you, you know. Uh, so, but the the, the one of the, the big things that when we'd have uh, patients or clients come to the office and they would do the beamer treatments, they would say they would go home that night. And they would say, this is the best sleep I've had in weeks and months. I haven't had this best sleep in my life because the relaxation uh, that it does to your body also helps you sleep well at night. And that was something that was kind of unexpected um, because there are, um, uh, with the technology, there, there are settings that you can use to be able to, uh, it's a sleep mode on there that you can actually run it throughout the night, but you let it run it at a very low frequency and it helps people sleep. So it's another tool to use instead of, you know, taking a, a, a medication route that have a side effect of, you know, you walk in the dark and out in the street and driving while asleep and all those kind of things, which we not healthy or safe. So we've had some great experiences with it uh, personally, as well as with patients. You know, I, I, I um, we've been talking about beamer technology, but, you know, the real technology is called the, the pulse electromagnetic frequency which is a, a pulse frequency that stimulates blood flow. But what, what Beamer does, uh, when you use a pulse magnetic frequency, the, the technology has been around for maybe 40 years, it, it, it um, has about 300 cycles per second to increase blood flow. Where the Beamer technology does the same thing, but it has about 1,200 cycles. So it gives you almost four to five times greater efficiency increase in blood flow than, than other technologies. And I've, I've researched technologies two years before I invested in a Beamer just to see um, what really worked and how it worked. And I'm just impressed with it because although they do the same thing, none of the other technologies compare to that. Um, uh, Beamer is, is a patented technology. And again, I'm not trying to sell Beamer, but I'm just saying if I'm going to talk about it, I want to talk about the, the, the top of the technology when it comes to helping people. And, and that's what we've seen. You know, there are a number of questions that came up and um, uh, someone asked about lymphatic drainage. Uh, what effects does this have on lymphatic drainage uh, from what you know, Dr. Atkins? 
Well, it's going to improve lymphatic drainage also because, again, lymphatic drainage is a result of fluids being pushed into the capillaries or arteries and perfusing tissues. And so, and then it goes back into the system and in the lymphatic system and, and drains out. So if you can increase that blood flow through the tissues and, and perfuse the, um, the tissues at the end of the capillary system, arterial system, you're going to get a, a better drainage. You're going to get, and then by adding things like massage to it, uh, you're going to really improve your, your lymphatic clearance. So I, I think it's a great tool for that. It, again, it's just an assistance for what your body needs to do already and can't do because of, you know, poor diet, poor nutrition, and lack of exercise, um, and, and those kind of things. Now, someone also asked a question about vibration plate and circulation. We know this is not a vibration plate, but the, we're talking about electromagnetic fields. Uh, this is a little bit of a tangential question, but either of you have any experience with vibration plates or the benefits well, thereof? Just, just to tie in with the lymph, um, the, the basic lymph drainage, rebounding, vibration plates, these kinds of things are going to help with, with lymph. Um, for the people who are asking about lymph drainage. And, and you can also do lymph massage. You can actually do massage that actually targets like moving lymph around your body. But massage in general is helpful for lymph drainage too. So so massage, rebounding, lymph drainage. So, so it would be a synergistic treatment. So again, you know, it's not necessarily one magic bullet, but synergistic uh, therapies, uh, depending on what what can benefit you. Yeah, I have a question though. Dr. Flo uh, Dr. Atkins, um, is um you were just mentioning pulse and i actually you know i researched this because i was putting together this is when i was putting together a treatment plan for my dad and he's doing really mm -hmm. well now and i was going to have him do this at some point but it so is pulse different from this beamer thing or it's just mm -hmm. a diff uh, it's an older version of it i'm confused about that part well, the pulse is um, the pulse are sine waves that they have put together that's supposed to improve circulation. They have, you know, they have a sine wave called a sawtooth wave. They have a, 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 a up and down sine wave, a traditional sine wave. But a beamer wave is an oscillating wave that vibrates about twelve hundred times per second, and they uh -huh. use it to carry. It's a carrier wave for pulse therapies. So it will give more pulse frequency to the tissues. So it increases the effectiveness of it. Uh, Beamer is developed by this this uh, scientist in Germany. It's actually it's German technology, and he invented the uh, and patented the um, the uh, Beamer technology, the, the Beamer wave. That was is what it's called. Uh, it's patented in five different countries, so they use that as a carrier wave. And that's the only difference uh, between Beamer and the other waves. But the Beamer is a carrier for pulse waves, and then what they do is they can actually uh, label. Uh, pile on maybe three or four different pulse electromagnetic waves on one beam away. So you're not just getting one wave, you're getting three or four waves at one time. And okay. so it affects people in different ways. And that's why it's so effective in, in all parts of the body. Some, some of the pulse waves, they work better in skin. They might make other pulse waves work better in organs. Other pulse waves work better in, in, uh, my, in maybe in the hands and the feet or um, in parts of the brain. But with the Beamer technology, what they found out, and this was, you know, I, I I did the research on it, and there are a lot of uh, abstracts and, and um, PubMed that talks about the technology and how it works. And there's some specific things about Beamer's, what I liked about it. You know, they talk about pulse electromagnetic, and most of uh, companies will give general information about how it works, but Beamer has specific uh, uh, test results or studies that show their particular results. So, yeah, it, it's really good. I, you know, I, I use it on my father in law, I've used it on my mother in law, you know, on ourselves, but, you know, I think using it consistently, you know, mm -hmm. memory function because it increased circulation to the brain mm -hmm. also. You know, you know, when you lay on the mat, you do it that way. You don't, they have other devices that you can use uh, for, for different uh, treatment regimens. You mentioned you use it yourself too. So like, it's, I mean, is there a reason why the treatment is, is so short? Is, would too much be a bad thing if you... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you, so Sosa wants to walk around in a in a, uh, in a, in a, in a beamer jacket, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you well, know. 
they have a beamer belt. They have a belt that you can put around your waist for people who have low back pain or people really? that they get stiff back and, and their back gets stiff lower back and they put it around your waist. And you, I mean, you got a, about an eight foot core. You can't walk too far, but at least you can get up, you can move around, you can put it on your shoulder, around your neck. What it does is in, increase circulation in those areas. So it warms you, it, it removes uh, the lactic acid buildup for people who work out, but it helps with, it helps with information because it, it's really, uh, by increasing that blood flow, if you're eating that alkaline diet like we should be eating, you 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 re reduce inflammation, and so it will help that way. But, uh, so but yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So basically, a healthy person can do it, uh, and it sounds like there might be a cap to how often I should be doing this if I'm a healthy person. Well, you can actually sleep with it, right? The uh, for talking yeah, you about sleep, sleep with it. Healthy purpose is needed if you want to stay healthy because, because everything in our life is really slowing down our circulation. I, I, I look at aging as a function of decreased circulation, and, and the cardiologists can tell you all about that, yeah. you know, because as you age, it's uh, everything is a decrease, you know, whether it's memory loss, whether it's cardiac function, whether it's mobility, whether it's muscle circulation, everything yeah. goes back that, you know, aging with the skin, it's a lack of blood flow. And, and, and so it all comes down to that. But I don't think you can do too much, to be honest. I do. I, I one time I was doing 16 minutes, three times a day. Wow. Uh, I, and I would do more. And, I, and you put on sleep mode, which is a very low mode. And you can okay. actually go to sleep on it. You know, we've had uh, clients who put it in their bed under their sheets and they put it in. So when they get in bed, they put a have a sleep uh, mode on it, put it on and they sleep through the night like like, you know, like. What's those medications, those sleep medications? That, you know, you know, <laughs> it sounds like you know, a grounding they, mat on steroids. Like it just sounds yeah. like really in like it would do way more than a grounding mat. Yeah, well, it's complementary to grounding, but yeah, you're right. It's it's like uh, yeah. it's using electromagnetic frequencies of the earth, and it oscillates these frequencies. That's the pulsation right. that you get. Super and the cool. technology says that the, the, the frequencies that the beamer map puts off is not any greater than say, the frequencies that the Earth is putting off. So you're not like getting bombarded with super amount because what they found out is you don't need a lot. It's not it's not the intensity that works. It's, it's the consistency that works because one treatment, one eight minute treatment is supposed to have your circulation. Your, your capillaries open up for eight to 12 hours. Wow. And the more you do it on a daily basis, it lasts longer and longer. So just one, you know, one eight minute treatment. So if you do that once a day, at least you go next 12 hours, you're going to be doing really well. Now, what and so you want to drink your somebody water. Somebody has, yeah. So what happens if someone's chronically dehydrated, they have low iron, they have low B12, or they have low nutrients that generally would, you know, impair circulation? Well, you said the first thing, I need to hydrate. One of the, yeah. one of the criteria to doing this is to hydrate. You have to drink water. And they recommend doing a mineral, uh, mineral water or actually spring water, because when you increase circulation, one thing that we see is that the more uh, tissues are demanding, the, are getting blood flow. So then if you are already nutrient uh, deficient, then you're going to get less minerals to tissues, especially muscles, and people can have cramps. One of, one of the side effects they see from a beam therapy, the only major side effect is sometimes people get muscle cramping, but that's mm -hmm. only because they're already uh, mineral deficient. And mm -hmm. when you increase blood flow, then it just, it just dilutes the mineral content in your body. So you want to do your minerals. You can do your, your, your uh, green powders and green drinks that are mineral rich, like your spirulinas and your, your Corella, your, your Moringa, whatever you want to do that way, or just do spring water. But the water is, is, is a key because it also, it's a flushing technique going through. So you need that extra water. And when those capillaries open up, then your, your central pressure can go down a little bit. Okay. Blood pressure. That was another um, mild to moderate reducing blood pressure. After you do Brema treatments for a certain period of time, there was a study on that. I don't have that, but uh, that was one thing we looked at in our facility um, on a more anecdotal basis to see with and, people. And, blood pressure. and you're getting greater flow to the microvascular, so that's an overall decrease in systemic resistance of flow. And so when systemic yeah. resistance of flow goes down, then then uh, blood pressure goes down and, and, and stress on the heart goes down. There, there was a yeah. question on biomagnetic therapy uh, as well, Dr. Atkins. Do you want to, is there some biomagnetic therapy we need to differentiate from this? Somebody asked about biomagnetic therapy. I'm not familiar with biomagnetic therapy. Um, Maybe using uh, magnets or something like well, that. 
I, I, I don't know <laughs> what he might be referring to, but the word Beamer stands for bio electromagnetic energy um, um, regulation. Okay. That's what the word okay. Beamer stands for. So it's a biomagnetic therapy, if, 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 if a short answer. Yeah. Okay. So it's a form of that. So it may be the same thing. This may have the terminology a bit different. Now, uh, yeah. someone asked about melatonin. Uh, Otis Granville asked about melatonin. I mean, that's a sleep aid. It's something produced by the pineal gland. Uh, and I guess that question came up related to improvement of sleep. Um, what are your thoughts on melatonin? Anybody? <laughs> I don't really <laughs> like my clients to get hooked on melatonin. Sometimes it can be helpful. Like if you're traveling a lot and you need to like support yourself, you know, changing time zones and all that stuff. But I find that sometimes people get dependent on it. Mm -hmm. And so I prefer to use like magnesium and natural things and talk to them about their stress and why their thoughts are running, you know, late at night, maybe you should journal before you sleep. You know, maybe you should, you know, just listen to, you know, ocean waves or whatever it is. And turn off the light, the cell phone, the blue light you're getting from the cell phone light therapy. People yeah, so that gets into sleep hygiene, Dr. Montgomery, where it's like, okay, yeah, is your room too hot? You know, you know, do you, are you staring at your phone before? Because a lot of these things are small, but they add up and most people don't pay attention to them. So I try to address all of those things in addition to how late someone's eating before they sleep. There's so many factors that can affect people's sleep. I try to do that versus giving them melatonin as a Band-Aid and then, you know, hoping that they can weed themselves off of it. <laughs> <laughs> so the Dr. Atkins walked away. So ask about uh, who, please find healthy, who should not. You know, I, that's a great question. A great question. Healthy. Uh, so this is the you, Dr. Atkins, to find healthy. Uh, some people think it's the it's simply the absence of a defined diagnosis. I don't think that's the case. What are your thoughts? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Repeat the first part. So uh, is there, please define healthy, who should not be using the Beamer unit? I think it's just uh, the, the main question, who should not be using the Beamer unit, but I want you to define healthy. So is there somebody who shouldn't, who wouldn't benefit from it, I imagine? Um, there is, um, there are very few people that wouldn't benefit from it because, you know, exercising, uh, would be a good option. Um, that's one thing that, that Beamer helps you in is increasing blood flow. So anything you would do to increase blood flow would, would, could potentially replace a Beamer, but again, it doesn't replace microcirculation. You know, if you're eating, say for instance, animal products or high, uh, foods that are, are, um, in, in, in fats, whether they're plant fats or you, you're eating um, any other toxins in your food, whether it's pesticides, herbicides, things like those things will clog up your system over time, but they have to be detoxified or flushed out or cleansed. And microcirculation is, is, is hard to get there. Now, again, that's why we age over time. I tell people, when you don't get old, you get toxic over time. So, you know, a, you know toxicity is a function, the major function of aging. Whether So when you have memory loss, when you're having um, um, a shortness of breath, fatigue, that's, you know, muscles are not functioning properly. That's where the fatigue comes from because you can't even produce energy. Uh, brain function again, cardiac function, you know, which ends up in heart failure. That's, mm -hmm. that's uh, all of these things that add up. So if you want to do something proactively to maintain optimal health, uh, that's something that you can include in, in, your, in your program, I think. Um, but Definitely. like I said, it's again, it's not not specific for disease. Dr. Atkins, um, so like I have generally low blood pressure. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. I, and I heard you say that if I did the Beamer, that the blood pressure would go lower. And, and I feel like mine is already so low generally that it probably wouldn't be a good idea for my blood pressure to go lower. Well, no, low is a relative term. Your body's going to adapt to whatever your normal perfusion. It's not so much the pressure, but the perfusion. So your, your body's going to maintain whatever the blood pressure needs to maintain unless you're taking something to lower it or unless you volume depleted, dehydrated. So, you know, you know, we say high blood pressure, low blood pressure. You know, somebody with a blood pressure 120 over 80, that blood pressure probably can still be improved. Maybe it needs to be, you know, 105 over 65. Right. Or 100 over 55. Right. So it, these numbers are kind of relative. Okay. So you're saying that yeah. that's out? <laughs> no, 
And 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 I can't explain any better than Dr. Montgomery. But yeah, your body compensates for it. it, it okay. Uh, one thing I want to say about the melatonin is even people take melatonin. I agree with you uh, that uh, it's uh, it's also that that taking it, people get dependent on it, and the more they take it over time, it tends to work less. And mm -hmm. people don't realize that when you do melatonin, you have to do it in darkness that you take the medicine but if you're in a room that has any amount of light in it it's going to be less effective or not effective at all so people got to the melatonin it didn't work they had the tv on all night or street lights in the room and all those kind of things so you know things people have to know about that they they think something's wrong but but again the, the relaxation it gets your mind slowed down you know move to costa rica somewhere i don't know what to tell you <laughs> Shout out for Costa Rica. Here's someone who wants to uh, reverse an LVAD heart device. LVAD stands for left ventricular assist device. These are uh, uh, pumping uh, devices that are implanted in the uh, chest uh, and it helps circulation. This is for people with advanced heart failure. And the generic answer is yes, uh, there are people who've been on LVAD devices and they've been taken off LVAD devices. And uh, some of the more common cases I'm aware of are young people who have a viral cardiomyopathy or some transient form of heart failure. They get on the LVAD and then uh, the heart improves. The LVAD goes off and the heart improves. I've had, uh, I don't treat LVAD patients normally. When someone has an LVAD, normally they're treated by an advanced heart failure cardiologist. But we have had people come to our clinic in our health center with LVAD saying, hey, get me off this thing. Uh, and usually I try to coordinate their care with the advanced heart failure people because they're the ones that, that work with it. I do recall one young man who had an LVAD and he said, yeah, I would turn it off for a couple of hours and turn it on. And, you know, he didn't feel any different. I wouldn't advise that because, you know, these things can clot your own blood thinners. But but the answer is, and generically speaking, yes, but it's not a common thing. Uh, but if you want to be uh, if you have an LVAD, you want to be reversed, you want to do an intense uh, optimal nutrition and, and therapeutic intervention have uh, a, a natural um, uh, integrative cardiologist um, like myself or someone else working with an advanced heart failure cardiologist, both of whom are willing to sort of work with you and weaning you uh, from that device. Um, let's see here. So these frequencies say for those of poor diets, except, you know, if you're on a poor diet, I mean, this is thought to be a synergistic uh, therapy. Now, the study that, that, I shared with you, these people were not on a, uh, you know, they were probably on a standard Western diet. They were in Germany, so they were eating, you know, dead animal flesh and various other things. So they did get improvement. So the answer, I think, generally speaking, it is safe, but you want to make sure you're hydrated and your diet is not too uh, outrageously bad. But, you know, people on the standard American diet, which in my definition is a poor diet, uh, can tolerate this treatment. But but you want to look at this as an adjunctive therapy, not as sort of the, the savior therapy. Uh, and so you want to be doing a lot of different things. That gives you the best chance for the best uh, results. Uh, toxicity can prevent sleep too. Yes, that's kind of a, a good message, take home message, a toxic diet. For us, melatonin stopped working. Then we discovered it wasn't good for us. <laughs> um, and then here's a, this is great information. Diet plays a huge role. Uh, and then thank you so much, uh, everybody. So final words, uh, it's also your takeaway message for our group before we sign off tonight. What are your final thoughts on this technology, but this whole subject in general? Well, I think the technology is super cool. It sounds like <clears throat> the best way to use it is like you were just saying, like it needs to be done in tandem with diet. And it sounds like you can use it to optimize your optimize your nutrient absorption, but you got to give your body the nutrients it needs. You got to give it enough fluids and you shouldn't just use this again as like another Band-Aid thing, but it sounds like it could really help people, especially who are having like, just need some drastic, you know, improvement in their blood circulation. And then it sounds like for people who, you know, are um, generally just looking to optimize their health. If they're getting the minerals and vitamins and, and the water they need, this is another way to just allow that to actually percolate <laughs> faster. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, great adjunct to therapy. I agree 100%. 100%. Dr. Atkins, your final comments. Um, well, again, I, I think it's a great tool just for... Um, increase in blood flow because again blood flow is everything in our life and we need to really optimize that at every opportunity we get so um 
Uh, what I would say is, you know, you can use the technology, you, you know, yourself. I know, Dr. Montgomery, that you, you're looking into starting in your facility where people can pay and just have sessions. It's like you would have massage sessions you can schedule on a periodic basis. You know, you want to do a, a, a number of sessions in a row to, to see the benefit of it. But and then doing it on a, on a recurring basis, that would be very helpful. Like people get massages because it will have that benefit. And, uh, you know, if you really can appreciate it, you, you can go further and um, just get the technology for yourself. Because there's some tools, I think, for health and wellness we need in our household, just like we need a blender, a good Vitamix blender for, for preparing foods or technology for that. But you have to take care of that also. And the, and the benefit when it comes to detoxifying and cleansing your body, I think, with this Beamer, is it's a, what I call a cellular detox. It detox on the cellular level. It's getting things out that, you know, that uh, olive oil may not necessarily do. <laughs> and, and it certainly works right uh, where the food works. And, and the last couple of questions um, about um, a detox drink. I think any super green drink, we talked about things with, uh, you know, spirulina, green algae, green smoothies. Uh, uh, cold pressed juices, um, uh, E3 Live. Someone asked, is a prescription? You can actually purchase one through a Beamer distributor. Dr. Axis is a Beamer distributor. Uh, and uh, you can get this. Um, uh, just go to Beamer.com and just look on their website and they can get you with a Beamer distributor uh, near you or reach out to Dr. Atkins uh, and uh, he can work with you on this. It doesn't require a prescription, but they do uh, sell through... Um, certain uh, distributors uh as usual this has been a great show uh thank you guys i'm going to see you backstage uh and uh thanks again for your contribution uh as always i'll see y'all shortly as i close out um and uh of course another uh great show in my opinion of course i'm biased but you know the beamer therapy as we pointed out is uh, an excellent uh, technology that helps improve circulation at the microvascular level and uh, I think it's something for you to really uh, consider, especially if you are if you're diabetic uh, or if you have uh, circulation problems that are, that are already diagnosed. Uh, if you've had any kind of uh, you know vascular treatment with stents or bypass in the lower extremities or in the heart, uh, you very likely have microvascular disease. But you know if you consume the standard American diet, you're trying to make changes. This is a technology that can enhance uh, your overall input. So. I think uh, you should give it some consideration uh, and, um, and and look up the data yourself uh, and make your own opinion regarding this. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, show. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't had a chance to do so. Uh, and uh, of course, share this information with loved ones, friends, and anyone who you think may benefit from it. Until next time, keep it fresh, natural, and live. Mm -hmm.